Hello, my name is Brandon Kappas, and today I'd like to talk to you about integrating scientific workflows into services and applications using CWL to address research data challenges. As you see at the tagline at the bottom, the proposition we, we have is that progress isn't frustrated because we don't have time as scientists to do the work, but because we don't have time to do the work twice. And the reason that we need CWL to integrate these is something that I like to call a catch-22 of research data. Building knowledge requires action and data. We need to have taken action to make the measurements. We need to use and interpret the data in order to develop that knowledge. But interpreting the data requires knowledge a priori. So we've already set up this chicken or the egg, this catch-22. And then taking the actions, and, and importantly, knowing what actions to take requires both knowledge and data. And this is very rarely something that's done by a single individual, but instead there are four roles that come into play here. We usually start with data collection, that is uh, performing a measurement, uh, making an observation, but and during that process we need to impose structure on the information that's being collected. Once we've collected that information, we want to curate that data, that is to guarantee a schema structure and organization that we can rely on to programmatically access that data as part of an analysis algorithmically or manually we want to know we need to be able to go where we need to go collect the data we need to collect and perform some analyses and very rarely do these three work uh, in series this is a cyclic iterative process where the data collection and the analyses that are needed to process that and understand that data uh, happen in a bit of a loop. The fourth role is the consumer role. And that consumer role is, is often the uh, most overlooked in my experience. That consumer role is one who explores the data, examines it, and acts on it. And that includes not just the researchers themselves, but program managers, PIs, um, management, anyone who has a vested interest and a stake in the data that's been collected and the analyses needed to process that data. Unfortunately, as we move around this loop from collect to curate to compute to consume, if we place a different person in each of these roles, we get farther and further away from the data itself and distance in both time, discipline, organization, and involvement negatively impact the ability to use data to develop that knowledge and to take action. As a case in point, when I began my work in the early 19, late 1990s, early 2000s, I understood the problem that I was addressing very, very closely. And while I still remember the work that I was doing at that point, I've lost track of some of those more in, intricate details. As we move closer and closer to today, of course, those details are fresher in your memory and you're able to use that data more effectively. In analogy, as we move from our immediate research group to a division, we develop less of a proximity. We have less of a proximity to that data, less familiarity as we move from division to organization, from organization to multi-institutional collaboration. We move further away. And so using that data and understanding that data becomes more difficult because data itself isn't fundamentally the problem. It's also the analyses and the computations and the uh, even the simple structure and organization of the data. So there is a concept, as many of you are probably familiar, of FAIR data. Data that is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. But FAIR isn't just for data. FAIR includes the analysis and must, because understanding how to use the data requires just as much knowledge and insight as the data collection and access itself. So we see here on the right side a, a pictograph, a cartoon of a, of a scientist who's come up with an idea, a workflow, an, a, an algorithm to process and understand the data they've collected. And we, we capture that through the CWL. Through CWL, uh, that compute engine, that organizational strategy, we connect through a, a card of dispatch to different types of consumers. And these consumers aren't just people. 
They include things like edge devices that might be relying on that data to perform an action, or perhaps they're contributing data and the dispatcher and the CWL are making logical inferences from that data and placing it in the right location, such as the DBMS that we see there at the bottom. Alternatively, we may need to present this data to an, an end user, a consumer. And so rather than saying, here's a raw set of data, we instead give them an application such as a dashboard, visualization tools, whatever that is, to make that more visible and accessible to people further from the data itself. This also allows us a streamlined way of integrating with different types of processing pipelines, such as Kafka and uh, MQTT and the like. But importantly, at this stage in the process, that CWL allows us to capture that workflow, capture that sequence, that order of operations, what needs to happen, with what information, when. But early in the process, we need this to be as flexible and as adaptable as, pro as possible. However, as we move from prototyping, ideation and prototyping into deployment and further development, what we need to do is replace that or deploy that CWL engine on something that's a little more performant. Something like a API gateway fronting Lambda functions if we're working in the AWS space. And of course, there are a number of parallels in Google Cloud and Microsoft and even in hybrid systems. Speaking of hybrid systems, we may want to integrate this with a resource such as an HPC system at a university or a collaborator that allows us to perform very complex operations uh, as part of that workflow. Now, as we get into the workflow itself, this is going to be familiar to most, if not all of you, but within a CWL, uh, we've been using uh, the Rabix Composer from Seven Bridges and Velsera. They've been a wonderful partner in uh, our development here. And one of the things that we'd like to look at is an example of how this was used. We're not going to get into the details of the individual program, but I just wanted to give you a high level, an overview of what's happening here. This program, called the Birdshot program, involves the synthesis of, of new materials. The synthesis is followed by mechanical testing, a specific type of testing, very particular test, uh, testing apparatus that have been developed over decades. From there into microstructural analysis and from microstructural analysis and mechanical testing and the synthesis and composition, the programmatic uh, variables that were tested, um, selection is made for the next set of algorithms, the next set of compositions, excuse me, the next set of compositions. These new compositions become the next iteration and this is repeated until the system converges on mechanical behavior that is optimal for the type of application. So at a very high level, that's what this workflow is meant to do. And as we build, begin building on the canvas, number one, we first drop in a data resource, the birdshot graph labeled number two. And the birdshot graph here abstracts away the details of that storage. Anyone can use this data even if they don't know the organizational structure, they don't know the uh, access controls, it's built into the workflow, or we can incorporate that as part of the workflow that the user needs to provide a username and password, some type of credentials. That information then gets multiplexed, split, and sent across a number of nodes. And these nodes represent uh, a, these different pathways. One pathway, the mechanical testing, needs to happen uh, in, a, in a very highly specialized way. The analysis is very specialized. This we need to correlate ultimately to those microstructural features in order to identify causal relationships between the microstructure and the mechanical response. And then both of these are fed into a third subdomain, which is a Bayesian optimization framework that selects the next set of compositions and, as I mentioned, begins the next iteration. We can collect these, each user, each person, each contributor, each scientist in this program can create their own piece of this puzzle. They build the custom tools and workflows that allow them to capture the nuances and details of their, their component, and that becomes a larger part of, then, of this entire workflow. Critically, as I mentioned before, we need to be able to deploy this in uh, other environments, environments that are run on local systems, environments uh, that are 
uh, archived system and processes that are archived for future use. And this is where CWL becomes so very valuable. It allows us to accomplish both of those goals. Rather than extolling the, the value of, of CWL, which again, I'm sure all of you are very familiar, we can use this then as ways of delivering this value to not only our collaborators, but persisting this for the program managers and organizations that have funded research or in incorporating that into other platforms. As an example, in the top right, the GTAD XP program is a program that we worked at at Contextualize for about two to two and a half years. And while we were working on that program, that particular group was using a database built by and maintained by the Air Force Research Lab, a, a system called HyperThought. And uh, we used this organization and the, the capabilities of HyperThought, the access pro uh, protocols and everything with HyperThought, to build up a, a data collection, curation, and analysis a pipeline with them, uh, with our partners there. And then from that, we thought, well, why can't we connect that to some other data that exists in HyperThought, the Camden data set? And as I mentioned, this GTAD XP took about two and a half years to develop, but in one day, we were able to migrate the, the results that we had in GTAD XP and apply those to Camden. And our infrastructure here provided a way for the, the uh, analysis itself to introspectively examine that data set, identify the topological relationships between data, and uh, integrate immediately into a, uh, a visual visualization tool. So we could plug this into a Camden J JSON profile that we see here at the center on the right, connect that with a some boilerplate that we use as part of that uh, UI development that standardizes the interface between an end user application and uh, a compute engine and then dictates the standard output from the compute engine that the user interface relies on to perform its work. So these workflows allow us, the development of these workflows allow us to build a, a corpus of capabilities that can be reused turned around in a fraction of the time of the original development uh, to integrate with UI and user interface and, and applications specific to particular roles. And in addition, this allows us to document both the data and importantly, its interpretation and understanding how to use that. So as an example, I'd like to show you a video here of that uh, user interface that we were just discussing. We begin by accessing an auth endpoint which is handled by Carta Dispatch, another Carta Dispatch endpoint that handles authentication and, and project selection. Once we have the project selected, we can fetch that data, and what it means to fetch data is very specific to the individual program, but now uh, the user can access and navigate that data set with zero knowledge of the underlying data resource. This type of exploration can be very helpful in, in standardizing how we inter, interplay with data to begin with. How do you begin exploring and working with that data? As we begin navigating, we continue navigating through uh, this, this particular data set. We can expand different uh, endpoints, look at the, uh, excuse me, different nodes within that graph. We can represent the data in this uh, AFRL HyperThought program as a, as a network graph very, very easily. We can identify files that are associated with that, properties. It gives the user the opportunity to explore the individual values before switching over to a table view that provides a simple HTML document, renders a simple HTML document that provides summary information or a report that was automatically synthesized from the data and so forth. And then we can move to the next project. This interface is very consistent, very familiar, and becomes a, a, a standard way of investigating that data to, to begin. This expands very nicely, very easily. So in this example, I've, I've generalized this, but we've implemented this now in a couple of locations where we have a research facility that say starts with information generated from a machine, moves through an IoT or automation platform like MQTT or IoT Core, before moving into an information management system, this could be a database and node storage. It could be simple travelers, collections, uh, uh, 
physical, actual physical forms that are then entered into a, a, a database or scanned into a, a, a resource. And the, these become accessible through Carta Dispatch to applications and algorithms as we see pulsing here on the right. As scientists and engineers develop these algorithms, those are exposed through Carta Dispatch so that we can access those through a compute platform that is FedRAMP compliant, that uh, where this collaboration, the scalability, the incremental development, the traceability are all present before providing this in that final application. So I've shown here how CWL allows us to capture not just the, the uh, access to the data, but the executable pipelines that capture the domain knowledge between, behind that data. The dispatchers allow us to connect those compute in a very abstract way between a user interface and that backend compute. We can standardize how the consumer base is going to interact with those results. And finally, that gives us the freedom to build a large number of applications working on this, uh, this single type of interface. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, point out our co partners and collaborators here such as Velsera, when Seven Bridges platform, ARL and AFRL as funding agencies and cooperate, cooperative and, and collaborative research with the Keck Center at the University of Texas, El Paso, George Institute of Technology, GT, and Texas A&M. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I appreciate your time.